Hey, fourth grade, welcome back. After a three-day Memorial Day weekend, we are in chapter 14, The Wand of Wonderment in our story. Um, I did a little research over the weekend into the author, Chris Colfer. Wow, if you get a chance, Google him. Check out all the different accomplishments he's had and all the different books. He's been um, in a TV show. It's a pretty amazing guy. All right, so let's jump in. Remember last week, um, they had had the meeting of the, the fairies, fairy godmother was taken, and now the kids are on their way out of the kingdom. And we're gonna see what happens next. So the carriage ride back into the Red Riding Hood kingdom was a difficult trip to make. Witnessing the enchantress take their grandmother's soul was the most devastating thing the twins had ever seen. Alex cried into her brother's shoulder for most of the trip back to Red's castle. She has mom. She has grandmother. And soon, she's going to have the whole fairy tale world. Alex sobbed. She's taken everything from us now. Hmm, not everything, Alex, Hunter said. He was the only re reassuring voice in the carriage. What does he mean by this? We always have each other. And we're going to figure out a way to get both of them back. Now, although... Uh, they appreciated his optimism. Froggy and Red just couldn't help but have some doubts. The world had been counting on the fairy godmother for the solution, and now that she was gone, nothing and no one seemed powerful enough to stand against the enchantress. I'm not sure we can fight this one, Connor, Alex said with tears spilling out of her eyes like a leaky faucet. For the first time, I really think the bad guys may win this story. The despair grew inside the carriage with every mile it traveled. The twins, Froggy and Red, racked their brains for a solution, but couldn't come up with anything. After a day and a half of traveling and worrying, they were very eager to reach Red's castle. Boy, that's funny, Red said looking out the window. I would have expected to be past the wall by now. Froggy and the twins looked out the window too. They were surprised. There were no signs of the wall in the distance. It did seem to be taking longer than usual to get back to the Red Riding Hood kingdom. Wait a minute, Connor said, and then he squinted at something in the distance. Does that say what I think it says? The others looked out the window to what he was referring. The carriage slowly passed a sign that made their stomachs turn. Where are they? The Bo Peep Family Farms. How is that possible? Red said, and her eyes grew twice in size. The Bo Peep Farms are inside my kingdom. Where was the wall? Froggy and the twins stared out at the rural hills surrounding them, wondering the exact same thing. A few minutes later, they discovered a group of Red Riding Hood soldiers standing at the side of the road. Hmm. They scratched their heads and looked around in bewilderment, just as confused as they were. Froggy opened the door and poked his head out of the carriage as they passed them. Ahem. <clears throat> Excuse me, good sirs. What is going on and where is the wall? There is no wall, sir. Hmm. What do you mean there is no wall? Froggy asked. I mean there is no wall anymore, sir, the soldier said. The whole thing disappeared earlier this morning. What? Red gasped. We were guarding the southern entrance when a very bright flash came out of nowhere, another soldier explained. Next thing we knew, the whole wall. Gone. Alex and Connor turned to each other each thinking the same thing. The Enchantress, of course. She started her attack. Red placed a hand over her chest, trying to calm her uncontrollably beating heart. Even after hearing the Enchantress's warnings firsthand, she'd never thought her home would be targeted. Were there any casualties? Froggy asked the soldier. No, sir. No one replied. Just a lot of confusion. Froggy shut the carriage door and sank into his seat across from the twins. So it begins, he said sadly to himself. It was dusk by the time the carriage actually approached Red's castle. 
They felt so exposed without the wall. And as they looked around the town, it was apparent the villagers felt the exact same way. Everywhere they looked, wooden boards were nailed over doors and windows of the homes and shops, as if the residents were preparing for a storm. I haven't seen people this frightened since, since the big bad wolf was around, Red said. It really reminds me of the days before the C-R-A-W-L revolution. Froggy took Red's hand in hers. Um, Froggy took Red's hand in his, how about? Her mind was too preoccupied to notice its cold, slimy texture. Esmia could have done much worse, Froggy said. Thankfully, this time, it was just a wall. His words had the opposite effect of what he had intended. Red pulled her hand out from his, and her eyes became watery. It's not just a wall, she said. That wall is what separates us from the rest of the world. It represents safety, victory, after years of struggling. The big bad wolf and his succeeding pack may be gone, but that wall has always been a symbol of peace to all of my people. At that, Red wiped away a few more tears that had escaped, embarrassed by her outburst. As soon as we get back to my castle, I'm going to order a line of soldiers to surround the town at once, Red said, and then nodded to none other than herself. We may not have a wall, but we will have protection. Froggy and the twins nodded along with her. The twins liked seeing Red give an official and selfless order as the queen. Maybe... Froggy had been right about her. Maybe there was much more to Red than they had ever considered. So they eventually reached the castle, and as soon as Red gave her order to the soldiers, the four of them headed into the library for a much-needed, quiet, and recuperative evening. But as they walked in, they were shocked to discover a surprise visitor who had been awaiting their arrival. Jack! Red yelled. The infamous Jack of the Beanstalk fame was nonchalantly sitting in one of the armchairs. He was tall, handsome, with broad shoulders, exactly how the twins remembered him. He wore suspenders, and his trusty axe hung right there from his belt. Hello, Red, Jack said, and stood to greet the group. Red went pale and stiff as a statue. Whoa, 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 what are you doing here? she managed. Visiting, obviously. The young queen could only make a couple high-pitched squeals as she attempted to form another question. Froggy's eyes went back and forth between Red and Jack. He couldn't decide if this surprise was good or was it bad. Well, this, this is unexpected, Froggy finally said and chose to smile. Jack's face lit up when he saw the twins. I remember you two, he said. Hi, Jack, Alex said. Hey, man, Connor said. Despite everything else on their minds, the twins really were glad to see him. Red grew anxious quickly and began looking around the library. Wait, Jack, if you're here, that means... Slam! The library door shut with a gust. They all turned to see... Goldilocks, standing behind them. You, Red said and pointed at her. She quickly backed away from her old nemesis. Hello, Red, Goldilocks said with a very fake smile. She wore tall leather boots, long maroon knitted sweater, and a silver sword sung from, swung from her side. She had golden curls and was just as beautiful as the last time the twins had seen her. But there was something different about Goldilocks and Jack that the twins noticed. They both looked much happier now, and they were on the run together. Goldilocks, Alex said, and she and her brother ran to give Goldilocks a big hug. What a wonderful surprise, Goldilocks said, and a proud smirk appeared on her face. Well, I would say it's nice to see you again, children, but you're hardly children anymore. Connor nodded. Thank you, he said. That's what we've been trying to tell everyone. Goldilocks playfully rubbed his head. 
I had at least four warrants for my arrest by the time I was your age, she said, and then she winked over at Jack. Jack also smiled at her. I'm a late blooming bandit myself, but I'm catching up, he said, and then winked back. They lovingly stared at each other as if no one else were in the room. <laughs> oh, relax, Red, Goldilocks said. We aren't here to cause any trouble. I'm not going to hurt you. Red snorted. You bet your porridge-loving indecisive behind you're not harming me. This is my castle. You're both wanted fugitives. How did you get inside? We used the front door. <laughs> Jack said blankly, they just let us in without any trouble. I grew up with most of the guards, remember? Hmm. Red looked back and forth between Jack and Goldilocks, really not wanting to believe the statement was true. It was frustrating to feel so disrespected in her own home. Does the word queen mean anything to anyone? Red shouted. Shouldn't my safety be the priority in my castle? Froggy decided to break the tension. Forgive us. We weren't expecting company and have had a rough few days, he explained, still a little on edge himself. Why don't we just have a seat and catch up? No one argued with this. Everyone took a seat around the big bad wolf rug. It took a minute for Red to gather her thoughts and join them. She sat next to Froggy, but left a noticeable space between them. Jack and Goldilocks sat across from them, sitting so close to each other that they looked joined at the hip. And of course, Alex and Connor shared an armchair adjacent to the couples. You just returned from the happily ever after assembly meeting, I take it, Goldilocks asked. Indeed, Red said with her nose raised slightly, because that's what we law-abiding rulers do. We meet publicly and discuss things that benefit the greater good. Hmm. Her words didn't affect Goldilocks, though, in the slightest. So where's the fun in that? Goldilocks said, happy to get under Red's skin. How did it go? Jack asked. Oh, it was awful, Connor said. The Entrantress showed up, kidnapped our grandmother, and she has our mom. Jack and Goldilocks looked at each other with the same inquisitive expression. Uh, what could she want with your mother and grandmother? Goldilocks asked the twins. Alex and Connor had forgotten Jack and Goldilocks had made a run for it long before they discovered who their grandmother was. Well, our grandmother is the fairy godmother, Alex said with a shrug. Hmm, surprise! Jack and Goldilocks did look rather impressed. Well, how about that? Jack said. The twins told them all about how they were from another world and their grandmother had traveled back and forth for centuries sharing stories of the fairy tale world with their world. Once Jack and Goldilocks had processed all this information, the twins continued to tell them how their father had used the wishing spell to be reunited with their mother in the other world and how they had discovered the fairy tale world by traveling through grandmother's old storybook. Yes, 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 yes. And it was very touching, Red said, waving her hands. They learned the fairy godmother was their grandmother. Then all three of them disappeared through a door that led into a different world, blah, 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 blah. You still haven't told me what the two of you are doing in my castle. The twins could tell. Jack and Goldilocks were interested in hearing more of the story, but knew they'd better appease Red before she exploded. Well, we wanted to see if any progress had been made with the Enchantress, Jack said. Nope, hasn't been any. Sorry, you can both leave now, Red replied quickly. Froggy placed his hand on her knee. Now, darling, let's not be rude. They may be emotionally distressing, wanted fugitives, but they are still our guests. The twins were eager to tell Jack and Goldilocks about the meeting from the previous night and really didn't wait for Froggy or Red to get to it. They told them all about Princess Hope being kidnapped and how the Enchantress had taken their grandmother and was starting to attack the kingdom. And there's nothing that can be done to stop her, Jack said, shaking his head in the same disbelief the twins had felt for days. Unfortunately not, Froggy said. I just don't know how the situation concerns the two of you, Red said, and then crossed her arms. Well, 
This affects us too, Goldilocks said. We don't want to live in a world ruled by her. We thought we could help. Help, Red said and laughed at the idea. And what are you going to do, Goldilocks? Steal the jewels, pick her locks, test all the furniture until it's just right. Goldilocks stood and glared down at Red. It made the queen squirm a little bit in her seat. Then she looked to the other folks for help. But for this, she was on her own. Is there something you want to say to my face, Grandma's girl? Goldilocks asked. No, no, I'd much rather say it behind your back, Red said. I thought after helping me escape, you had changed, Goldilocks said, but apparently I was wrong. Well, I thought helping you would make me feel better, but I suppose I was wrong too, Red admitted and sheepishly glanced back at Jack. Froggy raised his green index finger. Moving back to more important matters, he said. The fairies and monarchs don't have any clue what to do. The fairy godmother has always been able to just wave her wand and make things better. But unfortunately, she can't do it this time. So now, we're all waiting for a solution to arise. If there is one. The twins nodded. Goldilocks sat back down next to Jack and held his hand. The room was reunited with the helplessness that they had tried leaving on the carriage. Suddenly, Connor cocked his head like a puppy. Froggy, what did you just say? Hmm. I said no one knows what to do? Froggy said, not sure how this could be any clearer. No, 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 before that, Connor said, what did you say about the fairy godmother? Hmm. Froggy looked at him peculiarly, wondering why he wanted the horrible news to be repeated. I said... The fairy godmother usually just weighs her wand and makes everything better. Can we use that? Bingo, Connor said and immediately jumped out of the armchair and ran toward the bookshelves. Connor, what has gotten into you? Hey, Froggy, Connor asked completely in his own world. Where is that book we were looking at the other day? You know, the one that had the chapters about the wishing spell in it? Hmm. It took a moment for Froggy to remember. Miss, legends, collecting spells. It should be on the shelf too, over one, and below the books from your sister. I'm very specific, specific about where my books are kept. Connor scanned the shelves until he found it. Gotcha, he said with a very satisfied jump. He sat back down next to his sister and flipped through the pages. I think the answer that we're looking for it's right here in this book. Are you talking about using the wishing spell again? Could we use it on the Enchantress? Jack asked. Trust me, wishing someone away never works, Red said and then raised an eyebrow at Goldilocks. Goldilocks placed a hand on her sword as a bit of a warning. No, we couldn't use the wishing spell even if we wanted to. The spell could only be used twice and the evil queen was the second person to use it. I'm not talking about the wishing spell, Connor said, his eyes still glued to the pages as he was searching. I'm thinking about something bigger and better and found it. Connor turned the book around to the section he was referring to, The Wand of Wonderment. Ah, the title of our chapter. Connor nodded enthusiastically, expecting them all to share in his excitement. Unfortunately, everyone else just ex um, exchanged pitying looks with one another. Why are you all looking at me like I want to take my pet rock for a walk? Connor asked. This book says that whoever holds the wand of wonderment is invincible. Well... Whoever gets their hands on it could potentially stop the Enchantress. Sounds too easy. Hmm. Froggy looked at him regretfully. That isn't real, Connor. That's just a childish legend, like all the other subjects in this book. Okay, says the giant talking frog, Connor said with a bit of an eye roll. This book talks about the wishing spell, too. 
and we've proven that that wasn't just a myth. I bet most of the stuff in this book is real too. Hmm, the wand of wonderment, he read aloud from the book. Many believe that possessing the wand of wonderment gives the beholder the gift of invincibility. It is said that the wand is formed when combining the six most prized possessions of the six most hated people in the world. Although the idea is dubious, the legend of the wand may have some truth to it considering the materials needed are most likely of a magic background. So, unlike most collections, the materials required for making the wand of wonderment may change with the times. Hmm. Oh, come on, Connor said to the stubborn group. You've got to admit that it doesn't seem like too much of a stretch. Everyone was on the fence about this. Connor was frustrated that they weren't as convinced as he was. My sister and I are from another dimension, he said, and then he pointed at Froggy. This guy has been magically transformed into a giant amphibian twice. What part about the Wand of Wonderment is hard for you to believe? Connor made a very valid point. What about this wand was so hard for them to believe after all the other things that they had witnessed? At least it was an option, and an option gave them hope. Alex silently stared down at the book with a growing eagerness. Just out of curiosity's sake, Alex said, who are the six most hated people in the world? Well, Red looked up at Goldilocks, opening her mouth. By the world, Red, not just by you, Alex clarified. And Red went silent. Well, I would say the evil queen is a candidate, Froggy said, and the others nodded in agreement. Well, and then the giant, Jack said, and I'm not speaking from personal experience. People really are terrified of him. The Snow Queen, Goldilocks mentioned, her historic reign over the Northern Kingdom still sends shivers down people's spines. Hmm. Connor was all ears making mental notes of their suggestions. But who else? You know, I personally never cared for Miss Muffet, Red said, as if she was confessing a horrid secret. I mean, it was just a spider. Get over it. Everyone in the room stared at Red for a moment and then went on with the brainstorming. What about the sea witch who traded with the little mermaid, Alex said. I was always scared of her as a kid. Oh, yeah, I bet all the fish in the sea are afraid of her. Froggy sat straight up in his seat as another idea came to him. Cinderella's wicked stepmother? The whole charming kingdom despised her. This is great, Connor said. So far, we have the evil queen, the giant, snow queen, sea witch, wicked stepmother. We just need one more. Who's the most obvious? They all went silent and their eyes wandered around the room. Well, isn't it obvious, Red said, uh, the Enchantress? Lumps grew in everyone's throat. Red was right. Well, the Wander Wonderment was a good idea, Goldilocks said, as if it were obvious it was no longer possible. Everyone slumped in their seats, but Connor just would not accept defeat. What's wrong with you guys, he said. We can't let confronting Esmia get in the way. This may be our only chance at stopping her. He desperately looked to everyone in the room, hoping for someone to agree with him, but no one said anything. So Connor leapt to his feet, deciding actions would have to speak louder than words if he wanted to get through to them. He walked around the room collecting random books off the shelves. What are you doing? asked Alex. He didn't respond, but he did take a portrait of Red off of the wall and added a couple of candlesticks to his pile. He walked to the fireplace and promptly dumped everything into the fire. Connor, Alex said, those are mine, Red said. Have you gone bad? Froggy asked. But Connor stood in front of the fireplace with his hands on his hips, the fire slowly consuming the pile of stuff behind him. You won't need them anymore, Connor said. Don't you get it? 
If we just sit around and wait, the Enchantress is going to take over. Everything we love will be gone. Hmm. Alex wanted to share her brother's passion, but she just couldn't get her head past the odds. Connor, it's just too dangerous. It's practically a death wish. Her lack of faith was about to make Connor jump out of his skin. Doing nothing is a death wish. If building this wand of wonderment thing offers us a chance at saving the world, we would be idiots not to try. Connor was practically in tears, trying to convince them. Everyone looked back and forth. A decision had to be made. However, one thing was certain. Whatever they did, they risked losing it all. Froggy stood up abruptly. I agree with Connor. We know the outcome of doing nothing, so I guess I would just rather die fighting. Okay, that's one in favor of Connor. I've never been good at just sitting around, Goldilocks said, standing with Froggy. Besides, you're going to need someone who's good with a sword out there. That's two. Jack stood next to Goldilocks. If the Enchantress thinks she's taking over without a fight, well, she is mistaken, he said. Their determination made Alex's heart skip a beat. This is really a big decision to make, she told them. Once we make it, there is no looking back. We can't give up if the stakes become too hot. We won't be able to do it unless we agree on that. No matter what, we can't give up. Froggy looked to Jack, Jack looked to Goldilocks, and Goldilocks looked to Connor. The same confident smile appeared on their faces. Yes, I am up for the challenge, Connor said, looking to his sister. Alex nodded and stood also. Then count me in, she said, and smiled. Me too, Red exclaimed, the last to stand. I have no additional point to make, but I do support this adventure completely. No one takes my wall away from me and gets away with it. So Connor went to a desk in the center of the library and quickly retrieved a piece of parchment and a quill. Let's make a list of the things we'll need to make the Wand of Wonderment. We've narrowed it down to the six most hated people in the world. Now, what are these people's most prized possessions? I think this list could be difficult to make. Everyone sat down and began planning out the expedition. Well, everybody knows the Snow Queen's scepter is the most prized possession. It's where her magic comes from. Hmm, all right, Snow Queen, magic scepter, Connor said, and he wrote the information down. And I imagine the wicked stepmother's most valued possession has something to do with her family. Hmm, an heirloom for her atrocious daughters, perhaps? She won't be hard to get to. She still lives in the same home Queen Cinderella grew up in. Wicked stepmother, family heirloom. All right then, Connor said, and he wrote a note. Now the giant's favorite item shouldn't be difficult to figure out either, Jack said. There weren't many things in the castle when I traveled there as a boy. Mm, it's really difficult finding material things, you know, that size. All right, giant to be determined, Connor said. So the evil queens would have to be magic mirror? Think about all she went through to free that creepy bald man from it. Fine, evil queen, magic mirror. And just when I thought, thought our evil queen days were behind us. Well, it's in pieces at the bottom of castle ruins, but it shouldn't be hard to retrieve, Alex said, trying to comfort him. Yes, but what about the sea witch? What could she not live without? Her jewels, Goldilocks said without hesitation. It's what she collects in exchange for favors, unless she bargains for something greater. Sea witch loves her bling, Connor said, and he scribbled it down. So all we have left is the Enchantress. What is Esmia's most prized possession? Everybody drew a blank. What do you think? Could it be the jars? We'll have to come back to that. I'll put a question mark by her name for now, Connor said. So Goldilocks looked over 
um, his shoulder at the list they had compiled. These people live far and wide across the kingdoms, she said. How are we going to get around? Jack looked over the list too. Not to mention, a group of travelers would look awfully suspicious at a time like this. And we're going to need to travel fast, Alex said. The enchantress said herself, she's grown impatient. So the room was filled with a low humming sound as Froggy thought, hmm, yes, we're going to need something to travel in quickly and discreetly across the land. Let me propose we forget about traveling on land and maybe travel above it. Froggy hopped to the other side of the library and returned with another book. Alex recognized the title and instantly knew what Froggy was saying. We'll travel by balloon, Froggy said very excitedly, just like the travelers did in Around the World in 80 Days. I've got to admit, I've been waiting for a situation to arise that offered an excuse to build something like it since I read your book. Froggy, that is very ambitious, Alex said. But it just might work. Connor added, the Enchantress isn't going to be expecting people in the sky. This world is centuries away from aviation. Precisely, Froggy said and flipped through the book. He quickly grabbed the quill out of Connor's hand and began sketching something on the book or on the back of the list. Now, in the story, there were only three travelers, so all they needed was a large basket. But I propose we go even further. We need something to glide across the sky and sail across the sea. Let's build a ship. Froggy finished his drawing and showed it to the room. His proposal was a modest boat-shaped vessel with sails on the side of a large balloon above it. Can we build something that extravagant in time? Goldilocks asked. Jack took the sketch and examined it himself, rubbing the side of his head. Hmm, it's not really the construction I'm worried about. It's the amount of supplies that are going to be needed. The twins remembered he was a very talented carpenter, so they took his word to heart. Red took a closer look at the drawing. Exactly what kind of supplies would be needed, she said with a raised eyebrow. Hmm, Foggy looked down at the drawing. Lumber, very sturdy fabric, and a lot of lamp oil. Red squinted and quietly nodded, counting the things off in her head. Yep, yep, I have all those things in the castle, she said with a great big smile. Everyone did a little double take. Where? Well, we can weave the ship out of all the wood from my basket collection. I think my collection of summer dresses, that would provide enough fabric for the balloon and the sails. They were made uh, with the finest fabrics in the kingdom. And as for lamp oil, well, they keep barrels and barrels of it in the castle just to warm the water for my baths. And I take a lot of baths. Didn't you lose all the baskets in the fire? Hmm, most of them. But I've had plenty of birthdays and holidays since. My collection is practically complete again. The qu twins couldn't argue. If the dress red had worn to the happily ever after assembly meeting was any indication, the queen definitely had enough supplies to go around. I think it just may work, Jack said. I can have some better plans drawn up by tomorrow morning. Red, can you send for the best builders in the kingdom? We're going to need as many as we can get. Absolutely, Red said. Um, the third little pig happens to be one of the best builders in the kingdom, and he actually owes me a favor. He accidentally built part of his brick house on Bo Peep's property, but I pardoned him. How long will it take to build? Goldilocks asked Jack. Four, maybe five days if we work diligently. Three days if we work around the clock. Terrific, Froggy said. It's really a great idea, Froggy, Connor said. And Froggy smiled. I think so too. I'll make traveling a lot easier not having to trek through the northern mountains to the Snow Queen or up a beanstalk to the giant's castle. Then Jack cleared his throat. Unfortunately, we'll still need to climb the beanstalk, he said. Why? asked Alex. Well, the beanstalk is what summons the giant's castle. 
it won't appear unless the beanstalk grows to a certain height. Hmm, Connor scrunched his forehead. Where is the beanstalk anyway? I don't think we've seen it since we've been here. Then Red went silent and stared at the floor. Red, did you do something with Jack's beanstalk? Red looked around the room with guilty eyes. I may have removed it, she said. Removed? Jack yelled. Why would you do that? Well, it's an eyesore, Red said defensively. Besides, it was hard waking up every day and having that staring down at me. You know, after all this, she gestured to herself, Jack, and Goldilocks. Well, great, Goldilocks said. Now what are we going to do? Hmm, Jack sighed. I'll have to find the traveling tradesman again. Hopefully he'll have some more magic beans, or at least know where to get them. I'll leave as soon as I get the builder set up tomorrow. Then it's settled, Froggy said with a clap. The five of us will leave soon, when, as soon as the ship is ready. But then Red looked at him sideways. What do you mean, five? Goldilocks' mouth fell open. Don't tell me you were planning on coming. Well, of course I'm coming, Red said. I'm supplying everything for the journey, aren't I? Hmm, with all due respect, Red, Connor said, this trip may not be suitable for a queen. Excuse me, Red said, horribly offended. If memory serves me right, the last time we were all together, I had been kidnapped twice, thrown into a pit of demonic plants, and almost mauled to death all in the same day. So you're telling me my life can only be in danger when it's convenient for you? Red crossed her arms even tighter and looked away from the others. There was no changing her mind. Darling, Froggy asked, do you think that's the best idea given the history of everyone traveling? I'm coming, Red declared. I'm not sitting around here and letting the five of you take credit for saving the world without me. I should start packing immediately. I've never packed for an adventure before. Red giddily got to her feet and ran out of the library. The other shot Froggy a very dirty look. Hmm, I'm going to go talk to her and explain the situation a bit more, he said, and quickly followed the excited young queen out of the room. Jack went to the desk and began outlining better plans for the ship. Goldilocks stayed with the twins by the fire. A very proud smile came to her face as she looked at them. What is it? Alex asked. Nothing, Goldilocks said with a shrug. I just recall a time when I told the two of you to be brave. And now look who's doing all the convincing. Alex and Connor exchanged a smile. They had grown a lot since the last trip. I should feed porridge, Goldilocks said. I had to put her in the cable stables and castle stables, and she's never really gotten along very well with the other horses. So Goldilocks left the library, gently tapping the twins on their shoulders on the way out, and it grew very quiet in the library, except for the flames flickering in the fireplace and the strokes of Jack's quill as he worked on the ship's designs. You almost lost me there, Alex told her brother. I felt so defeated. Thanks a lot for pulling me back. Anytime, Connor said, and thanks for helping me cheat on my test in sixth grade. Alex let out a noise that was half gasp and half laugh. How did you know about that, she said. Connor looked at her. Uh, the only C or B that belonged on my test were my initials. He said. Alex laughed for the first time in two whole days. She missed the times when passing tests were their biggest concerns. Are you sure you're up for this? Alex asked him again. Connor thought about it. You mean another dangerous adventure through the fairy tale world collecting various items with the potential life or death stakes? Alex snickered. Yes, that is what I'm referring to. So Connor thought about it for just a moment and nodded to himself. Bring it on. All right, got to stop before we start chapter 15. Bean, there, done, that. See you tomorrow.